Hey everyone, my name is Max, and I'm back with another level design video. This time I'm talking about Yacht Club Games' indie platformer Shovel Knight. Last video I told you how designers can guide players through levels with hints in the environment. However, these methods aren't typically as prevalent or necessary in side-scrolling platformers. There are exceptions to this, most notably in Metroidvania games such as Metroid and Castlevania, the games for which the subgenre is named, as well as more recent titles such as Hollow Knight and Axiom Verge. In these games, exploration and backtracking are often heavily incentivized or even mandatory. However, this is rarely the case with games like Shovel Knight that are emulating classic platformers. In these games, you don't typically need to be told where to go. You just sort of go to the right most of the time, or follow an obvious breadcrumb trail of enemies or items. So, when it comes to traditional platformers, the designer's job is less about conveying to the player where to go and more about making it fun and challenging to get there. Now, what makes a platforming level well designed? A platforming level might sound like a good idea, but then it might not work so well in execution. This is because it doesn't matter how cool a level might seem. If the level doesn't complement how a character moves, it's not going to be fun. As I'm recording this, Shovel Knight currently has three different playable characters, each with their own unique styles of movement. We have the titular Shovel Knight, Plague Knight, and Spectre Knight. The King of Cards DLC starring the previously non-playable character King Knight is currently in development, but as it isn't out yet, I can't comment on it. So, right now I'm only going to talk about the first three characters and their levels. Let's start off with Shovel Knight. Shovel Knight has the most straightforward movement and items. He can swing a shovel in front of himself to perform a basic melee attack, or he can bounce off an enemy to deal consecutive damage or gain altitude. However, this requires skillful control of Shovel Knight, as missing a single bounce can be disastrous. Shovel Knight's items don't substantially enhance his range of movement except for in specific circumstances. Typically, Shovel Knight's abilities are used for dealing damage or propelling himself forward. The mobile gear can move you over obstacles, but again, this just serves to move you horizontally forward and doesn't change much of Shovel Knight's existing movement. This is why Shovel Knight is often positioned above or within jumping distance of bounceable obstacles, otherwise the player wouldn't be able to navigate the level. This makes the bounce mechanic a key component of both combat and exploration. Some bosses that are too large to jump upon even provide projectiles that Shovel Knight can bounce off to reach them, but generally speaking there are few components of Shovel Knight's levels that he can't immediately jump or bounce off of. To recap, Shovel Knight controls rather precisely, relies on obstacles and enemies to move through the world, and is at his best when fighting enemies at close proximity, especially when bouncing off of said enemies. Moving on, Plague Knight attacks by throwing potions and using his explosive leap. This is his equivalent to Shovel Knight's bounce attack. Now, it should be immediately apparent from the first screen of the first level that the platforms are much higher in Plague Knight's sections. This is to compensate for his double jumps, mid-air potion tosses, and huge leaps. Plague Knight even gets abilities later on that let him place down his own platforms and shoot forward in a diagonal uppercut, both of which improve his already impressive vertical movement capabilities. Plague Knight also excels at horizontal movement, as evidenced by the massive ravines which are notably wider than those in Shovel Knight's campaign. As you can see, Plague Knight has no trouble getting across these gaps, despite the absence of enemies to bounce on. While Plague Knight has a much wider range of motion than the other characters, he can be slippery and chaotic to control, which is something the levels are designed to accommodate. For example, enemies are rarely positioned in front of platforming challenges like in the other campaigns because they would only serve as obstacles rather than a stepping stone that assists the player through the level. If enemies are placed on platforms, they are intentionally there to be obstacles. This becomes super obvious if you look at the sections of levels that are unchanged between the two campaigns. This also means that the player will need to approach this familiar problem in a new way. Plague Knight doesn't need to precisely target nearby enemies to get through a section. He can accomplish all the platforming on his own by blasting through like the mad scientist he is. As for when he does deal with enemies, the player can experiment with different casing combinations that affect how Plague Knight's bombs are thrown and how they behave. This allows Plague Knight to react to different enemy positions on the fly and from a distance, regardless of where they are. Unlike in Shovel Knight's campaign, where the player could pretty much only attack enemies within melee range, Plague Knight's abilities and levels encourage the player to attack from a safe distance, since he's pretty much useless when it comes to melee combat. Where Shovel Knight might use his bounce ability to take on a boss, Plague Knight would use his leap ability to run away and attack from afar. In summary, Plague Knight is imprecise but has an unparalleled range of movement that allows him to circumvent most of what would give Shovel Knight trouble. Plague Knight also has a large assortment of customizations that encourage fighting at long range. All of these differences between Shovel and Plague Knight, minus the bomb customization, are taught to you in the first level, mostly on the first screen. Plus, the only written instructions you are given is how to perform his leap attack. Everything else is conveyed through gameplay. This is a testament to how good design can show you things non-verbally. Finally, we move on to Spectre Knight. Spectre Knight has some items that increase his mobility, but they aren't super important compared to his base abilities. Spectre Knight's equivalent to Plague Knight's Leap and Shovel Knight's Bounce is this diagonal slash. 
Since it can only be used on objects that can be damaged, the Diagonal Slash is similar to Shovel Knight's bounce. However, the way they move is quite different. Shovel Knight moves in a sinusoidal wave pattern as he bounces, whereas Spectre Knight cuts a jagged path through levels. Additionally, in complete opposition to Shovel Knight, Spectre Knight is usually positioned below the objects he needs to use to platform, otherwise his slash would launch him into an endless pit. This repositioning of enemies often lets him dash into walls, which smoothly transitions into his wall run ability. This ability lets him climb up flat surfaces momentarily before leaping off. This is why Spectre Knight's levels include plenty of narrow vertical pathways for the player to wall run between. Sometimes these walls have objects or enemies that block the player's path, forcing the player to use the diagonal slash to cross between walls. Thanks to his slash attack, Spectre Knight has longer range than Shovel Knight despite them both being melee characters. This is compounded by his teleport attack which lets him close any gap between his enemies instantaneously. Spectre Knight also has another movement ability, completely unlike anything else in the game. Namely, his rail grind ability, which allows the player to move surprisingly fast in a nice change of pace. Get it? Change of pace? Oh, whatever. <laughs> Seriously though, many stages in Spectre Knight's campaign have been stretched out and reconfigured so that the player can race back and forth on the rails. This drastically changes the levels and their pacing more than any other adjustment in any of the three campaigns. Best of all, the rail grinding, diagonal slash, and wall running can all be combined in later levels, resulting in layered and intricate situations. All things considered, Spectre Knight moves precisely like Shovel Knight, but requires tight areas to wall run on, or wide open spaces to rail grind through. So there we have it, the differences between all of the characters, and how the developers had to change the levels to fit each campaign. Also, without giving away too much to those who haven't played through everything, some bosses have been substantially altered across the campaigns because they straight up would not work at all with all three movement styles if the bosses were left unaltered. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and hopefully there'll be more in the near future. Thanks for watching! I think that went pretty well. No.